Okay, so today we are going to talk about system design case studies. Actually, from the complexity of systems, is actually only subsystems. What we are going to talk about are, but the methodology that we are going to follow is applicable even for larger systems. Of course, for very complex systems, there is a need to do a partitioning before we follow this methodology. But as far as the scope of this course is concerned, we will confine ourselves to systems of this complexity. Further, it is important to realize that in today's lecture, what we are going to talk is almost sums up what we have been trying to do in throughout this course till now. We will be using all the techniques that we have you know, learnt and apply it for actually doing design of systems. Those of you who are registered also for the lab course, primarily as far as the lab is concerned when you are doing the projects and so on, the techniques that we are going to use there for implementing systems is primarily what we have covered till today's lecture. So, let me talk about first of all, whenever we consider any subsystem, we, are, we look at it as two components a data component and a control component. The reason that one has to look at it in two parts is the techniques that are used for designing the data and control are significantly different and we will see that as we go through this today's lecture. What does it, what, what does these two components imply? In terms of functionality, the data part is the one which implements all the data transfers. It implements the storage wherever you need to store the information, it also implements the transformations that is all the type of operations and the operator required to implement these operations. Operations could be arithmetic operations, they could be logical operations, they could also be operations of the type shift and so on and all these are primarily implemented in the data part of the system. The control is the one which actually performs these operations, initiates these operations data part by itself is only capable of doing operations, but the operations have to be done in a certain sequence to implement your particular functionality, to implement your particular algorithm and those sequence of control signals by which you generate, you perform the or implement your algorithm is through this control signals. There could be let us say n control signals and these control signals control all the activity that happens within the data part. On the other hand, it is after all an interactive process, any algorithm that you have typically except for very simple algorithm, the sequence of control operations, sequence of operations that need to be done is dependent on the data. It is not that you have to go ahead and do the same set of operations irrespective of the data and because of the data you need to change your sequence. Typically if you think in terms of the state machine, all the inputs to the state machine or the one which changes the sequence because they define what is going to be the next state. And these are called the status signals and we can say that there are m status signals that are coming from the data part. And lot of problems actually get very neatly solved if you are able to generate this interface clearly. That is you are able to define what are the control signals, what are the data part components and what are the control signals and what are the status signals which are going to be the input. The technique that we will use presently as far as this course is concerned, the data part will be designed more in an ad hoc manner. We will be using the MSI modules as the basic building blocks to define looking at my algorithm and trying to get a data part out of it. As far as the control part is concerned, I will again look at my problem functionality written in some algorithmic manner and extract a control, extract the state machine out of it. And once I have a state machine, I can follow exactly the state machine design procedures that we have learnt. So, later on if you, as uh, any of you who intend to do a course on CAD, they will, they can learn of techniques and tools which actually can do these things automatically. When, but such an automation is necessary only when the complexity grows very high. But typically for small problems, one can do this manually, partially manually and partially of course through our tools. But the partitioning and the identification of components is done more by let us say knowing that what are the type of components available. And in today's two case studies that we are going to consider, we will consider the, uh, the steps that are required to do the design. Let me just first of all identify the steps. 
and then we will follow these steps to actually do the design. You have a problem functionality given in some manner as an input output relationship or as a just a language specification that I have to do this. To implement that I have to choose an algorithm. Algorithm here I am using it in a you know in a most generic sense in the sense that it could also be a sequence of steps it could be a you know complex algorithm anything it could be so that is one which implements the functionality that you need it is like for example you had to implement a let's say a hardware sorter you have to choose the sorting algorithm that you will like to implement then you have the identify the data modules this is as i said is done more in a manner that is based on just on your experience looking at the algorithm what are the type of operations this algorithm requires how many of such modules you will use and what nature of these modules you will use, you have to use such, identify such net data modules. So, when I say data modules, typically I am referring to operators in storage. Once I have identified it, I also have to do the interconnections required. We will see again, see this. Looking at the algorithm, we can do that. Then once I have these data modules, I also know the control signals that are required. Typically, every data module has some type of control signals. If you are talking of a register, it has a load signal because you can decide at what, in which clock cycle or typically to, we call it as which control step, you need to load this register. If you have a counter, you could have load, any, you know, clear, load, preset, all types of control signals. If you have something like an ALU, which can perform addition, subtraction, let us say, then you will have one bit control signal to define whether you need an addition to be performed or subtraction to be performed in that particular clock cycle. You can change the functionality of this module by selecting the function select input of the ALU. So, that is what we mean by identifying the control signals. Once I have identified the control signals, we extract the state machine for control. The implication now here is look at the algorithm, look at the data modules and break it down into a sequence of control steps or sequence of states by which I can implement the algorithm on these data modules. We will again see as we go down, we will see the example of this. Then finally, we implement the state machine to complete the design. So, because once I have the state machine, this part is fairly automated, like you can do it mechanically also by following the methods that we have discussed. So, this is the overall process in system design and any type of a design, it is very important that you actually follow these steps. It is not that you directly jump to the implement sta implementation stage, ignoring all the other steps. So, that is very important because that actually gives you a certain documentation, it gives a certain structure, modifications are easy and later it is also we can see that testing is also easy to do the functionality. So, the example that I am going to first of all take up is a GCD computer. So, what is really required is to find the greatest common divisor between two numbers x and y and the result has to be available on z. Of course, as soon as we talk of the problem specification, so such a block diagram is fairly important because this shows you what are the inputs and what are the inputs. This is typically the starting point for any design. Of course, because we are talking of systems, hardware systems, it is also important to know that what is going to be the width of these what is going to be the nature of these inputs, whether they are 8-bit inputs, 16-bit inputs, they are signed, they are unsigned, they are positive only, whatever it is. As for our discussion, we will consider only positive unsigned numbers, only the magnitude is given or unsigned numbers where the magnitude is given and let us say that they are 16 bits. Because this is going to be useful for selecting actually the sizes of components, even performing the operations that are required. So, this definition is important. For example, when you do a software implementation, this is an aspect that you do not really have to consider. You just take the, you just declare them to be int or integer and then the base machine, whatever, however the way it implements integers, it goes ahead and does it. But here, because when you do the hardware, you have to be careful on this because the cost of your design is going to be significantly influenced by what is the data size. So, you should know what your problem requires. So, once I have this, the next step is I should choose an algorithm. So, here I choose a very simple sequence of steps which implements the GCD. 
is by repeated subtraction and I am writing the steps. I will have some interfaces, so I will have some, some somewhere I will read input. So, I input some x and y, two variables, are, two inputs I have taken and I am going to now do a while on this. While x is not equal to y, I keep on repeat it. So, I will come out of it when x is equal to y. Then I check if x is greater than y, then I do x x minus y and if else if x is less than y, then I say y y y is assigned y minus x and this is a repeated subtraction and I keep on repeating it and once I come out, I know that x is equal to y and then I transfer this values x to the output. <coughs> so, I have a very simple algorithm to do it and what I really want need to, I am planning to do now is to build a hardware which will actually implement this algorithm. So, first of all, to building such an hardware, I need to do what are the type of operations I need to perform. I identify the operations, there is a not equal operation, there is a greater than operation, there is a subtraction operation. These are the type of operations, so I need something to support these operations. So, I may decide that I will use one comparator and one subtractor. One even need not do use two of them, there is also a mechanism that from the subtractor itself you can decode, but let us say for uh, just for illustration I decide to use two such operators. Subtraction also can be used for doing comparison. So, let us say I use two operators and then I also have to decide, so one thing is this is regarding the operators, the next thing I have to decide is regarding the storage, I need to store information within my subsystem or within my system and I need to store x and y are actually inputs. If you look at this x and y are input ports and input ports are being supplied by an external device, output is going to again to an external device. I need to have storage inside my machine to be able to update. I cannot update this particular port because this is something coming from somewhere else, I do not have a control. So, if I have a register inside, I am in a position to change its value. So, I will decide that okay, I will have two registers or three registers R1, R2 and R3, X will be stored in R1, Y will be stored in R2, Z will be stored in R3. So, this is a this first decision I make looking at this and I can for all such simple designs, I should be able to do this manually quickly. So, once I have this, I have the beginning of my data part which starts looking like this. So, I have instantiated these three registers, I have three copies of registers and the width of these registers is very clear what is the width of the register, they are 16 bits because we are doing 16 bit operations. I will have a subtractor which is 16 bits, I have a comparator which is again 16 bits. Now, if I look at it, I now need to build the data part completely. Implication is I need to make the interconnections that are required to carry out my algorithm. Interconnections as far as the data part is concerned. If I look at it, what are the interconnections required? As far as comparator is concerned, it need to get the data from x and y. Of course, x and y would have been stored in registers R1 and R2, I have decided that. So, I need to transfer the output of register R1 to one input of the comparator, output of register R2 to another input of the comparator. Similarly, in case of the subtractor, in case of the subtractor, the situation is slightly different. I need to do both x minus y and y minus x. Either I have a subtractor which can subtract from any operand to the other operand or I need to multiplex what is going to come into the first input and what is going to come into the second input. So, let me say that my subtractor can only subtract, you know it has clearly identified port, it can only subtract this input from this input, this is plus and this is minus. So, what implication is I need to put a multiplexer here. I need to put a multiplexer here and I will
I will make these connections. And these connections are fairly simple to see that from your analysis of your algorithm you can make these connections. What are the inputs required? What are the operations required? How the data routing needs to be done? Because I need to get, do R1 minus R2, I should have one input to the multiplexer coming R1. And because I need to do R2 minus R1, R2 should also come as an operand over here. The other alternative is if I, my subtractor was capable of subtracting any input from the other, I would have a control signal over here to be able to perform this type of a subtraction. I need to transfer this result to R3. So, I will have this and this output I am going to call this as Z, which is going to be the, my output. Now, let me look at the input R1. What is the capability I need at input R1? I need the capability to get the result because I need to have R1 assigned R1 minus R2. So, I need to assign this output. But that is not adequate. I also need a capability to store x into R1 because initially the value of x is coming externally. So, I need again a multiplexer over here which x as an input and exactly in a similar manner I will need another multiplexer here with y as the input. So, this is x, this is y. And remember all these lines are 16 bits wide, though I just shown them as one line, but they are all 16 bits wide. Now, I need to have some outputs going from the comparator output. If I look at this, and this is now is uh, important to see. If you look at this comparator operation, comparator operation here, the outputs that are generated by the comparator, they are what are referred to as status signals. The reason is, see this is a purely a data computation, I am going to subtract and store the result into a register. But these are going to change the sequence in which the operations are performed. So, these are going to go as an input to the control unit of your machine. because depending on x is greater than y or not, I am either going to perform this or I am going to perform this. So, if you really consider in terms of the states of the machine, I am going to go to a different state here and a different state here for a state machine. Similarly, this is going to give me whether which state I am going to go. We will see that once you draw the state diagram. So, these are the status inputs that I get. Now, of course, depends on what type of a comparator I use. Let us say I use a comparator which has three outputs. There is an output called less than, there is an output called equal, there is an output called greater than. Let us say this is the type of a comparator. So, I need to make a little a small changes in my description to be able to account for this less than equal to greater than outputs that are coming from the comparator. We will see that. So, now I have this. So, this is what I refer to as the data part. In literature, many times it is also referred to as data path, basically because of these paths that are present over here, the interconnections, which are typically of width not just one bit, but they are of bits larger than. So, I have completed this. Okay, no, it is not still complete. There is still one more thing required that is identification of the control signals. I am not mentioning all these registers have a clock. The clock is implicit in any register that I use. Let me identify what are the control signals. I will have the control signal for each of the registers load R1 load R2, load R3. Each register will have a control signal. I will have the control signals for each of the multiplexers. So, select, let us say this is a multiplexer which selects x input. Select x, select y, it selects the y in, sorry, select, 
R1, select R2. One selects the source for R1, another selects the source for R2. Select, subtract 1, first input of the subtractor, select, subtract 2. The second input of the subtractor. These are the two select inputs that I am referring to. So, I have these loads and these select inputs. So, in total, seven control inputs I have showing to this data path. Seven control inputs and three status outputs. So, this is the design that I, ha I have chosen for my data path. So, if I just to re emphasize what I said before, what I have achieved till now is I have designed this and I have very clearly identified the status signals which is 3, I very clearly identified the control signals which are 7. These control signals will come from your control part, these status signals will go to your, again to the control part. And this is now a clear data path that I have for the algorithm. Now let me look at the control part. Before we do that, we used a comparator which was not exactly performing this comparison operation as outlined here because the two operations that I need is not equal to and greater than. The comparator that we chosen was less than equal to greater than. Of course, I can do one thing. I can just put an inverter on this equal to and get a non, not equal to output and I can go ahead and perform the operations that we, in the manner. But here, if you look at it, there is a, some scope for optimization. The scope for optimization comes from this fact that because I have a comparator which has three outputs, I do not need to do these two checkings in sequence. The way this loop is going to be implemented, if I write a, even a program and compile it in any language, First, it will check whether it is not equal to, then it will check whether it is greater than. But the very fact that my hardware module can do these things, separate these three parts out, greater than, equal to and less than. So, what I can do is I can rewrite this part, case R1 compare R2 and then I can write the three things greater than, less than. See, I am right now not defining any particular language syntax because whatever I am writing should be very clear to you. These are like just like any high level language that you are considered. Later in the course, we will introduce the language syntax for this and we will also teach you some uh, syntax and semantics of a language which can be used to do this. But for the present, let us do it in very informally. So, we have this greater than, less than, equal to and what you do need to do is when it is greater than, I have this operation. But after performing this operation, I need to go back to whatever is this label. Okay. Similarly, in case of R2, I need to do this and again I need to go to L1. And in this case, I need to just transfer R3 and get out. So, here I am looping back and here I am going to uh, just perform this operation. And what, whatever is, is the end, go to end or whatever is there. <laughs> you can write it in any other syntax. So, this is the so, you can actually do these operations and this is what I am going to now show you in terms of a state diagram. So, once I have broken it down into steps like this, I can have a state diagram to do this. So, if you look at the state diagram, so what I have over here is, the first step is going to be the step in which I am going to S1 is the one when I am going to load the inputs into the register. So, when I am going, what I am going to do is here, when I want to load X into register R1, 
what are the control signals I need to activate? I have to do select R1 should be X. When I say select R1 should be X, what the implication is in my data path, this select R1 is this control signal. This should be made 0 or 1 depending on if I connected the 0 input, I should make this 0. If I connected it to the 1 input, I should have made it 1. So, I am just writing it symbolically, but after all you can write this in terms of binary patterns zeros and 1s. That, that, that conversion is a trivial conversion. So, I select R1 should be set to X and I should have load R1. Select R2 should be set to Y and I should have load R2. And these are what are going to be associated either if you are doing a Moore type of a machine, you can associate this with the state and if you are doing a Milli type of a machine, you can associate it with this edge, with this transition. So, it is the choice is yours. So, let me just do here a Moore because we have done a number of Milli machines. So, let me say that at this state, I need to perform these operations. Now, let us come to so, now this what this whenever I come to this state, I will be loading this and I will be performing this. But not what happens now to the S2 is, S2 is the time when I need to perform this comparison. Because if you look at the algorithm, the first thing is I loaded the value and then I, now I am going to perform the comparison. As far as comparison is concerned, there is no, no control signal required for doing the comparison. Okay, so because R1 is, I do not have multiple inputs to the operands as a comparator. If I have multiple inputs, I would have to activate the proper select input. Okay, so I do not need to do that. So here I need to only after S2, I only need to do a branching. So let us say this is going to be equal, this is going to be greater than or less than, this is going to be greater than. These are the three out status inputs. Based on this, I am going to branch either greater than, less than or equal. And now, I can associate control signals with each of the other. What will S3 do? What do I need to do? In S3, I need to implement R1 is to be assigned R1 minus R2. So, that means, I have to get the proper inputs to the subtractor. So, select sub 1 should be R1, select sub 2 should be R2 and I should have select R1 should be subtractor and I load R1. These are the four control signals required to perform this operation. If you again go back to the data path, what I am doing? I am selecting this path, I am selecting this path here, here, so that R1, R2 and finally, I am selecting this path to get the result back into it. And all of them is being achieved in one clock cycle. At the end of the state, I would have achieved it. So, timing also I will discuss in a moment, but let us just, S4 is exactly similar, except that I have to select do R2 minus, is assigned R2 minus R1. So, I can write select sub 1 will be R2, select sub 2 will be R1, select R2 will be subtractor, load R2 will be active. S5 is the one where I am going to transfer. So, S5 is nothing but if you consider the R3, I am going to get R1 into R3. So, this will be simply be load R3. And once I have done this, I will come back to this particular edge. I am not commenting now because there are some changes that are required. But this is the state diagram and once I have written the state diagram and associated the control signals that are required with it, I can easily implement the state diagram. These edges refer to that go-tos that I had. Basically, after performing this, I should go back to the repeating this operation for repeated subtractions are required. An important issue is how is the timing works? You have to have a timing, very clear timing model of your circuit, especially two things that are involved. All operations that you are performing takes time, first of all, and your clock cycle is going to be, for this assumption of the simple design, 
our assumption is the clock cycle is greater than the greatest delay that is there in the circuit for performing any of the operations. So timing is like this. If this is my clock, all my state transitions takes place with my rising edge. Operations are performed during this period. This is the time that is given for the operations. And this is the edge at which load takes place. All the register loads at this edge. And this model will consistently work if you follow this model. At the, so, all the, so you perform the operation at the end of it. So, when you give a register load output, so register load is going to get generated. So, basically at this edge is what is going to be loaded. Not Sorry, at this edge it is going to be loaded. Enable is going to come over here. This is the enable that you generate when you say load R2. This is the signal that you are going to generate. And it is at the trailing edge. It's at the, so, operation gets performed here. So, if you are doing a subtraction, if you are implementing R2 is R2 minus R1. This is the operation that you are going to perform. The select input for the subtractor 1 will be active right from this in the whole clock cycle. Select for the second operand will also be active in the clock cycle and subtraction will take place during this period. At the end of this clock cycle, R2 will get the result. So, each time whenever you are doing load, whenever you are doing, you know, similarly when you are doing a comparison, of course in this case there is no control signal required for comparison, but the state transition is going to be taking place here because this is the state that you are in when you are doing the comparison which corresponds to your S2 state in the diagram and then you will go to either S3, S4 or S5 leaving this time for the comparison and that is important because you comparator is going to have a delay and your clock cycle should be long enough to accommodate the longer state. In all this design that we did till now, we ignored the interface part except the data interface, we never considered how this circuit is going to actually interact with the outside world and that is important in any design. So, here I introduce some additional control signals, start and end of computation. Start is a signal which is going to tell you that I have, whichever device is going to supply data to it, after all this going to work with some other external device. If you are building such a circuit in lab, it could be a push button switch. If you are building in a system where this is just a part of another, some you know, other subsystem that is going to supply the X and Y, after supplying X and Y, it should actually put a start signal. The start could be a pulse, it could be a level we start with, we say that let us say it is a pulse. If you put in a start signal, then the computation is over, then you once the output is there, you should indicate to the device which is going to read the output that the computation is done. So, the implication is, if you now think in terms of the timing, you get your start and your data input during the time when the start is given, your x and y should be stable. Other times, I do not care. This is the one that, so this is your value of x, this is your value of y that you need to compute the GCD. And once you are registered this information, your end of computation will, this is your EOC signal and there is a break. It could take any number of clock cycles. After all, it depends upon how much, what is the value and how many subtractions that need to be performed and how many clock cycles it will take. At some point in time, they should go up. And at this time, once it goes up, your value Z should be stable, which is nothing but the GC. This is the timing that I need from this particular device, so that it gets interfaced to the outside device. Now, to be able to do this, what changes I need to do in my circuit? One change I need to do is, in my data path, I need to introduce a flip-flop called EOC. 
once I enter the state S1, where I am accepting the input, I will, and this particular EOC should have two control signals, preset and clear. A flip flop, you can even use an RS flip flop for this or you use a clocked RS flip flop or any D flip flop, you can use, get the input, whatever. So, this particular flip flop output is nothing but the EOC signal that I am producing. As soon as I come to state S1, which corresponds to accepting my input, I can preset this, uh, sorry, I should, I should clear this EOC flip flop so that it is goes low, EOC output goes low and once I have finished my computation, finishing of my computation is reflected by reaching the state S5, I can preset this flip flop. Till the next input comes, my the R3 value is, will hold. So, this extra, this is, these two are going to be counted as extra control signals and this is an extra output that is going to come. How do I accommodate my start? Start is fairly simple to accommodate and here of course, some timing considerations are going to be there. I introduce a state as 0 and I wait start bar. So, what I do is I wait for this start bar and instead of and then from here I go to after I have finished this and reach this state S5, I go to S0 and I wait for the next start signal to start computing all over again. So, this is the wait state, this is the initial state at which I am going to wait for a start signal to come and once the start signal comes, I start computing. I keep on going in this loop as many number of times as I need to perform subtraction. Once the two values are equal, I come out and then I load R3. Not only load R3, I should also now what should extra I have to do here? Preset. preset. I have to preset EOC and I have to clear EOC here. These are extra control signals that would be and this will implement now a complete interface. This is a device now, it is sort of a complete standalone device. I can work with an external input. So, there are still some issues involved. Issues in terms of you should be very clear about the timing of your inputs. What is the assumption when I draw a diagram like this and I am assuming that the start is coming? Typically, see, subsystems are today typically synchronous. That is, this is a synchronous design. It is all going to be clocked. All the data transfers are going to be synchronized to the clock. All the state transitions are synchronized to the clock. But these devices typically work asynchronously with other devices. Implication is the another device that you have designing will not necessarily work on the same clock. It is not even advisable that it. So, the data transfers are asynchronous. When you are doing such an asynchronous data transfer, there are certain restrictions which come on to the width of these pulses. The implication is when I am doing this and start is asynchronously coming, the implication is the width of the start should at least be one clock width because otherwise I may miss the start coming altogether. After all, I am going to make this transition only at the clock edge. So, if my start is going to come, if this is my clock, then the start should be of this nature. At least it should come whichever if it is a falling edge or the rising edge, whichever edge it is that uh, my transitions are taking place, it should be for one clock period. Then another problem involved with it. So, other problem is what happens the start is very wide or let us say the numbers actually are equal and the GCD is it immediately comes out. If the start is too wide, what will happen is I will go ahead and compute the GCD of the same number again and again because I will come back over here and so how can I avoid this? On this edge, mm -hmm. 
Once I reach the computation, I can put a start over here and I can put start bar over here. If, if my, of course, signals are synchronized and if this start is actually happens to be only one clock width, I do not have to do these things because all this is going to cost you in terms of hardware. More conditions you put because this was a do not care condition before and do not care is the better input condition because all your transitions, are, you know, it is less expensive to perform the transition. The circuitry will be smaller. But of course, if you cannot ensure that your start is of one clock width, it could be five clock widths. Actually, we do not even know how many clock widths. Just in two clocks, it can come out over here. The numbers are equal. I compute S1. I go to S2. Find the numbers are equal. I come over here and say this is my GCD. The two numbers are equal. So, I can put this condition start bar over here for my return to S0. So, what this shows is you have to be very careful about what is the timing of your interface signals and these things can be taken care of in your state diagram. Some of these things also introduces changes in your data part like we have to introduce that EOC flip flop to be able to take care of this. So, this design of course, we have considered in detail. I will consider the second case study in a smaller time like I will try to go through it quickly. So, here I am trying to design a FIFO buffer, a first in first out buffer and the interface looks like this. Data in, this buffer of course, again I have to say it has to have some width. This buffer also has to have some size. I have to say that it is let us say a 16 by 8 buffer. That means, I can store 8 values of 16 bits each. Just remember your data structure that you in your course that you implemented your FIFO data structure or a stack data structure. So, we are talking of a FIFO data structure over here. So, an interface is an add and delete are the input control signals. I can perform an add. When I perform an add, the data gets pushed into it. When I perform a delete, this get up pushed out of it and that particular data gets and this size of this is 16 locations. Because it is hardware, I cannot do things like malloc. I actually have to pre decide what is going to be the size, the maximum size is fixed. The device which is going to push the data in also monitors a signal called full and the data that device which reads the data out also monitors a signal called empty. The idea is it should not generate a delete if it is empty and it should not generate an add if it is full. So, that is the responsibility of the other device. We can also build in some protection over here, but this is to give the status information of the FIFO to the devices which are interacting with it and this is a complete now design. I will try to implement this. So, the operations here are fairly simple. When I need to perform an add, what I really need to do is I need to copy this data in, into the location. When I am doing a delete, I am copying this into data out and also removing that location. And it is clear that this thing can be done by just using two counters. You can just keep track of what is going to be the head of the queue and what is going to be the tail of the queue. The other important thing whenever you are using a fixed structure is the wrap around part. That is what happens if I keep on going, I am doing add and delete, add and delete, I have counters which keep on keeping track of where I am doing add and delete. If I use a let us say an array structure, when I reach the end of the array, I should again come back to the beginning. Fortunately, as long as you choose a 2 raise power n size, this part is straightforward. The modulo arithmetic, modulo 2 raise power n is automatic in all hardware devices. If you use a counter which is 4 bits, it will go come count 0 to 15 and when you say count again, it will come back to 0. So, there is no extra effort required to doing the wrap around. So, I choose a memory type of an implementation. There are other type of implementations also for FIFO. You can actually have a set of registers to implement a FIFO, but that is more complex and we choose a memory type of an implementation. I have a memory which is just a linear array and in this case, I will have a memory which is 16 by 8. I need a counter. These two are counters. Both of them are counters and this is a head count and this is a tail count. I need two flip flops. One is a full flip flop and another is the empty flip flop. This contains the status of this. 
Now, if I write down the operations, I can very clearly write down what are the operations required by the CFO and then I can complete this structure. So, I would leave this as an assignment for you, but you can see a few things. For example, if there is a memory, there is an address input and what is the source of address over here? Both the head counter as well as the tail counter. So, that means you need a, a max. So, you need to supply this max with both the input output from the head and output from the tail. What is the width of this max? No, 4 bits because I need only 4 bit address over here. So, I need 4 bits. So, somewhere though I may have 8 bits, the output of this is going to be 8 bits. Now, the data in that is coming. So, depending upon the memory I have, if I have a memory which is let us say a bidirectional memory, the port is bidirectional, then I need some way to enable the input onto this bus. Remember what I discussed before. So, what I need is this is my data in and I need to get this data in over here and this is a tri-state buffer. The reason it is a tri-state buffer is when I am reading data out, I do not want to clash with it. So, this buffer will have a control signal enabled and yes. The word size is 8 bits, 16 by 8 memory, I have 16 uh, locations of 8 bits each. Uh, it could be 8 by, you can assume anything that will change things, yeah. Yeah, I think I started uh, mentioning, okay, I took 16 data bits, okay, so I, let me make it 16. Yeah, so it's 16 locations, let us say of 16, so I should call this 16 by 16. Yeah, that is a mistake, please. Thanks for pointing out. So, now I have my register and this register will have a load input and I will take the data out from here. This is my D in and this is my data out. Of course, registers have to be clocked. Memory is asynchronous, there is no clock. Counters have to be clocked. I am just showing this symbol and which means all these clocks are connected. This Full and empty flip flops require preset and clear. Preset full, clear full, preset empty, clear empty. So, you can complete this. The counter we have to choose, counter we need an increment. So, enable, enable head, enable tail because they need to go. There is some our circuitry required actually to generate, once you write the condition for full and condition for empty, you will realize that some more circuitry is required to compare because the such a counter is full or such a FIFO is full or empty not because of a value at the head and tail, but the relative values. One is tracking the other and from that you can find out. So, you can do this design uh, of the data part. Let me just complete it by talking about the control. So, now, I am in state S0, this flip flop, uh, this FIFO buffer is in state S0 and I can get, what can I get? I can get a add or a delete, these are the start in inputs which start. So, now if I want to make it foolproof, one thing is when, when let us say an add comes, what is the situation if there is, if the FIFO is already full, what should I do? I should overwrite because it is actually the responsibility of the other device that it should not issue an ad when it is full, but let us say if it actually issues. So, now depending on what the decision of is, you can say that the condition here is add and full bar. If you, but if you want to override, then you can ignore this and whenever ad comes, you can put this. Similarly, you can put a condition over here, this is delete and empty bar. So, this is again part of your design that you decide what you need to do and you can complete this state diagram, all the other con input conditions. So, now all the other status, input is here status, for control unit all the inputs are status inputs. Add and delete are two inputs which are externally coming empty and full. So, all the other uncovered things can be kept here, the uncovered things are delete and E bar, either this is, neither this is satisfied 
nor this is satisfied. This is the condition that you will keep on. Because under this condition you will go here, under this condition you will go here. Yeah, it is, yeah, so, so you can write the condition over here. So this way you can uh, generate this. Again, all the timing issues are important because what happens is you have to know whether add or delete is synchronous one clock width because you don't want that the same value is added. If you return back here and still the add signal persists, you don't want. So that means you will, this is the add part, so you will say, you will come here only when add bar is there. And if add is there, you wait. But if it is just one clock width, I don't have to do these things. So you can now complete this such a state diagram along with the data path, write the control signals and do a design. So it is important to analyze the design at this level very clearly in terms of not only the states, not only the control signals, but also in terms of the timing of the interfaces. And then the design problem is fairly straightforward. With that, we stop. Thank you.